All right, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. I warned you the three pages are hard, didn't I? I, I warned you. All right, <clears throat> I just want to make one question before I get started. So we do not have class on the uh, 6th. That's Passover. Anyone celebrating? Happy Passover. I'll be in New York. Um, I No, 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 April. April. No, 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 March 6th, no, April 6th. I want to go over a sample midterm from a prior year, but I don't have a class day to do it. So I think what I'm going to do is hijack one of the Langdell sessions. Okay, that, that's my attentive plan. So I'm thinking you have a Langdell, just tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's on Friday the 14th, is that right? Just check your calendars. Is it Friday the 14th or Saturday the 15th? Saturday, Saturday. Like, just that make sure my calendar, okay, that's right. It was Friday, okay, so what time on Saturday the 15th? 12 to 1.30? It's just, 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 can everyone confirm that? Is it Saturday the 15th from 12 to 1.30? Is that right? Does that sound right? Okay. So I think what I'm going to do is I will, uh, with brief permission, of course, hijack her session, and I will just go over a sample midterm from a prior in that class. Okay. So what that means is what I hope you all do is you don't have class on the 6th, so basically the week before. I encourage you to take that time to take, I'll just tell you which one I want you to do. Um, they're all listed up here. Uh, just do the midterm from fall of 2020. It's right there on the syllabus. Take, I'm asking you please, to take 90 minutes and do it in quiet. No, don't like do it in bits and pieces, do it start to finish. Um, on any time you want, but, but maybe the day we don't have class, that might be a good day to do it. Or that weekend, and then we'll come in the next day, the next week, the fifteenth, and uh, uh, I'll do the review session, and that'll be for my day and night students. You'll all be together. We want happy family. May fall of twenty twenty, the midterm. It's on the syllabus. Yes. March fifteenth. April. No, not March. April. You're not ready for midterm quite yet. April, you'll be. 
I don't know. If someone says 12, it'll be that, whatever that day is that Saturday. I'll, I'll get the time with Bree later, but I will uh, confirm that. Is that okay with everyone? I usually like to do it during class, but we're not going to have class days to do it. And I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to sacrifice a class day for that. April, <laughs> April, not March, April, April. The reason why is, okay, it's, but, okay, good. Yes, sir. Uh, you said like we're not ready for it now, so when would you recommend that we do do it? Uh, a couple weeks. In a couple weeks? Or like yeah. A couple weeks before? I think you'll be ready to do a midterm around spring break. Okay. That, 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 that's usually, I would usually say you can do midterm around spring break. That's roughly the halfway point. Um, that's, that's my guess. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to record? No, I'm not. No, I'm not going to live stream it either. The reason why is I want you to come and ask your questions. It's not useful if you're just watching a recording. I've done these in the past on weekends. Oh, my God. This is before COVID. I did it once on a Saturday or Sunday. You know how many people showed up in person? Uno. One person. It was a waste of my time. So I'm never doing that ever again. So you'll be here. Well, fun. We'll enjoy it. I'll give you a month's notice to make for arrangements. Yes, ma'am. No, 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 no. No, I, what I... And the reason why is I have 100 students combined. I can't, I can't go over those in, in short notice. What I'd like you to do is bring your exam with you and ask the questions on the spot. And I will stay as long as you need to go through all of your questions. I'll be in my office afterwards. Okay? Yeah, I, I've, I've done that before also. And it just it, it becomes overwhelming. Because uh, I, I used, I'll be honest, I used to grade the midterms during spring break before I had children. Uh, and I can't do it anymore. It's just, we can't do it. You'll, you'll realize this as you sort of grow up and get a family. Life changes. Uh, I used to spend about 60 hours a week doing nothing but grading midterms during spring break. And the worst part of it all was I would work so hard to give it back. And then some students never even came to pick up their papers. They never even picked up their papers, never came to talk to me, never came. I've done this in the past. I didn't do it anymore. I would make, I would make it mandatory to meet with me. All 100 odd students, 140, however many I had. I would get here at 8 in the morning and still at 8 p.m. And we would door be open all day. And guess how many people actually showed up at half? Um, so I stopped. I stopped killing myself for an effort that wasn't actually producing any results. I'm sorry that you're suffering the benefits, but I find this is actually more useful. Those who actually want to take and take it seriously can come ask me whatever questions they want. I will work with you. And those who don't can just stay home and do whatever they want to do. Okay? They say Mardi Gras. I mean, say Mardi Gras. Is that where all the beads are out? I, I, I don't want to tell David. I have no idea. Okay. Oh, happy, happy, happy Mardi Gras. I just see beads and yellow and green shirts. Okay. All right, uh, I'm actually going to New Orleans on Friday, which thankfully we should be quiet by then. Okay, questions? All right, so again, today's class is not going to be a walk in the park. Um, if today's class ends up not making sense to you, please rewatch this video once or twice. If you don't get today's class well, the next two weeks can be miserable for you because it gets worse. It sort of builds one on top. Of, it's not like a one-off topic. It builds. All right, so let me just start off by asking some questions to review from our prior class. And, and again, the first four questions are just review, so it shouldn't be, I hope not, shouldn't be too, uh, uh, too much um, difficulty. All right, so question number one, please. At common law, an easement and gross was assignable, true or false? And uh, who is uh, next up on my uh, lineup? Someone has to be next. No one? No one remembers. Oh, who are you pointing? Ben, are you next? I'm what? I'll volunteer. No, I don't want you to volunteer. Who's actually next? That's not fair to her, right? Okay, so, Jay, Ben, are you actually next? Yeah, you ended up. Yeah. I ended on you. Okay, so is it, well, Alfred, did you go? <laughs> Fernando, did you go last time? Can I call on you? Oh, yeah, I don't know. All right, I'll just start there. Fine. I have enough time wasted. All right, another, another 10 seconds. Put your answer in. My evening class never remembers. So I start every class right over there. They just, they, they start able, they remember. So, okay. Start from the beginning. It's also only 30 of them. So it, I call each of them twice per class. All right. Fernando, help me out. What's your answer here? Okay. Why do you say false? What's the only way that an easement gross can move from one person to another, Fernando? You can't assign it. What's the only way you could actually move? Duke? Right. Well, assignment and conveyance are the same thing. The, the same words. Julian? I thought it was 
No, you could not convey it. Julianne? Inheritance. Correct. So a common law, this is false, so about 60% of you got this one right. At common law, an easement in gross cannot be conveyed, cannot be assigned, cannot be sold. I don't care what words you want to use. No interview of transfers. But you could inherit it. So imagine, you know, uh, your father had a um, easement gross and you're his heir. You inherit the easement gross. Okay, now, if you read the book chapter, it's a little bit squishy on this point, right? Some courts said you could assign it. Some courts said you couldn't assign it. I'm just going to make it simple and say common law, they were not assignable, right? I, I don't need you to do like a 500-year case survey, all the different cases, but this is good enough for our purposes, okay? Good? All right. Sometimes I have to summarize stuff that's not, it won't perfectly map onto every court that's ever decided a case, but I try to make it at least straightforward. All right, let's do question number two, please. At common law, an easement and gross could be divided. Be divided. <clears throat> this be for, I'll come back to Duke. Okay, another 10 seconds, please. All right, Duke, what is your answer, sir? False. So why do you say false? Because my understanding is that the, I guess, you take both the owners. So, yeah, so that would be the, the owner of the dominant state. What's that rule called? There's a rule we mentioned last week. What's that called? He didn't hear. Uh, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> Connor, what, what's the one stock rules? Since you're on, you're on point today. Uh, uh, both parties who own these easement agree to uh, transfer it or must. Right? Correct. Correct. I think Duke and, and Connor are saying the same thing, right? So this is from the Pocono case, the uh, the Lutheran Conference case. At common law, there was a rule called the one stock rule. The one stock rule, which meant an easement and gross that was acquired jointly can only be divided or severed jointly, right? One party couldn't alienate or convey his interest unilaterally. Um, if they both agreed, they could divide it. But again, a common law, you couldn't really even convey an easement. So this would have to be in a jurisdiction where you could convey an easement in gross, and then you could decide to divide it up if needed. All right, good. Yes, Ivan. Prepared to argue number two. All right, go for it. So with the one stock rule at common law, you have to have an agreement among the parties to divide it. So it is divisible in a sense. I know what you're saying, right? If you aren't able to convey it, what's the point of dividing it? No, 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 no. It, no, it, it's I'm trying trying to be I'm trying to answer your question carefully, right? The only reason the only reason the one stock rule matters is if you're trying to convey the interest to the third party. If it's just the two of them and each have an easement that's divided, which doesn't really make any sense. Like, what, what's it doing? They both have access to the, to, to the Serbian estate, don't they? So I, until there's a transfer, the one stock rule really has no actual teeth. Because right? imagine the two brothers just kept using it and they divided it, but they could both still use it. So there's no actual legal effect. Again, I you can fight me. I'll, no, you're fine. I, I appreciate students who fight me. That, that that that's useful. Keeps me honest. But I, I don't. Before transfer, the one stock rule really has no teeth. That's what I would say to that. Yes, Fernando. Would that would that be feasible, like in a divorce, where they acquired it together and then they decided to split up and then they divided it? I've never had the question before. So imagine a married couple has an easement in gross and they divorce um i have no idea how the one stock rule would apply to a divorce i have no idea my 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 you know my tentative five second answer is even if there's a divorce um they would still both be able to use the the, the serving property serving estate 
Now, the trickier one is what would happen if it's marital property, which I think you'll say last year. That would, I don't know that you could, well, Pennsylvania is a common law state. It's not marital property. I have no idea how that works. I have no clue. Uh, if you want to do some homework and look up marital property, one stock rule, I would encourage you, but I, I have no clue. What else? I've never thought, really thought of that. All right, let's go to question three. All right, actually, no, let me pause for a minute. If you can't tell, the common law did not like easements in gross. The common law preferred easements at per tenant. Why? Because they're cleaner, right? The easement's attached to a piece of property, and whoever buys and sells property doesn't matter because the easement sticks with black acre. With an easement in gross, there's a lot of complexities, right? As people come, they go, they move around. You don't remember who has the uh, who has the easement anymore, right? It's mobile because it goes to an individual person. So the common law made it hard to convey the easements in gross, and they made it hard to divide them. They much prefer the easement at per tenant. More transactions were bad for the common law. All right, everyone with me? Modern stuff's easy. Piece of cake. You can do whatever the hell you want, right? Mostly. All right, so let's try number three. Under the modern approach, an easement in gross is assignable. Is assignable. Do for uh, Johnny in a few moments. Oh, now there's a pig in addition to a panda? Yeah, just a little zoo over here. I don't get it. Someone definitely puts like care into this, though, because it always comes back whenever it's a race. But someone really, really matters to someone, so I guess it's it's, it's important. All right, Johnny, what's the answer number three, please? True. Okay, why do you say true? Yeah, common law you can do whatever you want, and that's why I rarely ask about that. I'm sorry, modern law you can do whatever you want, which is why I rarely ask about it. The rules are so flexible. The modern courts have said, why are we restricting these interests? If they want to be conveyed, let's convey them. And I'll just I'll skip the question four. Can you divide an easement and gross into the modern approach? Yes, you can. That's true. Question four is true. Right? Um, keep these rules sort of straight though for uh, your your notes for common law though. Now start question five. What did you guys do in question five? Okay. At common law, oops, sorry, can you assign an easement at per tenant? This is question number five. Before I say Ellen, a few moments. Or I'll stop it here. I'll say, oh, what's your answer, sir? Um, it's false. Okay, why? Because we lose the land. Correct. The answer is false. An easement at per tenant <clears throat> is attached to the land, or, or as I say, said, runs with the land, right? With an easement at per tenant, there's always going to be a dominant estate and a serving estate. We know who's dominant. We know which one's servient. You cannot change that. You cannot separate the easement appurtenant from the property. The, the easement's connected, it's linked to the property, right? You can sell the dominant estate, you can sell the serving estate, and the easement carries along with it. Again, with an easement and gross, there's always a separate transaction. You're, you're separately selling the easement and gross. With the appurtenant, it's going to always be attached to the property and it rides along with it. Ivan? If you were to sign the Land, would that be the same as like signing the easement? I don't think that's a fair reading of the question. Okay. Um, but if I were to convey Black Acre, the easement would come along with it. In other words, you can't sever them. You can't separate them. So I, I, I think it's not a. You would never say I'm assigning you an easement at pretending. You would say I'm, ass I'm assigning you Black Acre, which includes easement at pretend. Good. All right. Everyone, everyone go with question number five.
Okay. Let's try question six. Six and seven. We'll do those back to back, please. All right. So this is six. And six and seven are the one continues for the next. So six says A owns Black Acre, B owns White Acre. B sells A in easement, allows A to cross White Acre. At common law, A and B are in privity of contract. True or false? Privity of contract. And keep in mind, question seven asks about privity of estate. It's the same question. So I want you to answer both those back to back. Do number six first, and we'll do number seven. <clears throat> for Alex and I think Sinclair on deck. Or did I, Ivan, did I skip you guys? Okay, then, then I, Alex and Sinclair. All right, another five seconds. All right, I think it everyone. All right, same facts. Now, now question seven. At common law, A and B are in privity of a state. Now, again, six is asking privity of contract. Seven is asking privity of a state. And just, just consider that when you put your answers in, please. All right, another 10 seconds. I'll stop it. All righty. All right, Alex, so help us out. What is the difference, Alex, between privy of contract and privity of estate? Okay. Oh, that's very good. That's very good, actually. I think that, that that's actually very close. Um, Sinclair, let me ask you this question. So question six. Is this a valid transaction? B sells A in easement that allows A to cross Whiteacre? You say it's valid. Why? Because he is in charge of like, his own land, so he can sell that easement to A. But didn't we say that in order to create an easement, there has to be the sale of a property? Right? You couldn't just sell someone an easement and, and just make it like that? You know. Didn't we say that? Remember the Church of Christ case, scientist? Lenore, do you remember? That's a parking lot case. Yes, good. By, by the way, I, I don't mean to, to, to depart. I'll come back to you in a second. You need to know the case is facts called for the exam, right? The reason why is I give you a fact pattern. And you need to instantly recognize, okay, he's giving me facts. Which case is similar to the facts he's giving me? And then you'll figure out which case I'm talking about. And you'll have to discuss cases. Okay, this case is similar to the Church of Christ case. It's different, so on. So if, if the facts of the case we studied two weeks ago aren't clicking, that's what we need to think about deeply for the well, midterm for sure and also for the final. So Manor, yeah, that was the parking lot case. So Manor, can we just create an easement just by selling it from one to the other? Can you do that? You can't, right? What we said in that case was that the creation of an easement requires conveying property. That is, a person owns Black Acre and White Acre. They convey Black Acre, but they reserve an easement for themselves. But Anna, let me ask you a question. Can two neighbors just make an agreement to allow one to cross over to Black Acre? Just, just an agreement? Can they do that? What might you call that? It might not be an easement, but it might, it might be called a what? Uh, no, let's just say it's oral. What would you call that? What's the word for that? We have a word for it in this class. What do we call that? You learned it last year, last semester also probably. They let someone to your property temporarily. What's that thing called? Don't say it. Don't say it. Let her get it. When we discuss easements, there was another thing. Joe? 
license. There it is, right, Anna? License. All right. So the, the recall, uh, the recall uh, here is for a topic on licenses, right? A license be oral, it be written. So look, A and B can make a contract, can't they? To allow A to cross Whitaker. Everyone agree with me right there, right? Is this a valid contract? Absolutely. It may not actually be an easement, right? We called it an easement, and that that that's fine. You can call it whatever the hell you want. But I think there's actually an enforceable agreement here. There's consideration, right? It's in writing, probably. This can be enforced. What happens when B, I'm sorry, when A sells Black Acre to C? And B moves away as well. Let's say new people come to town. Is this agreement binding on the successors? The answer is no. Again, this is just a contract. There's privity between A and B. There's a contract between A and B. It does not bind their successors. So we say that there's privity of a state here. What's lacking over here? I said, I said it wrong, sorry. There's privity of contract here in question six. What's lacking in question seven? Privity of a state. Right, so let's just look at our numbers, right? The answer to number six is that there is privity of contract. Why is it off? Did it? Did I not ask question seven? You did. Oh, the number is rough. Oh, th thank you. Thank you for that. I'm sorry. I messed up. Okay, so look, th this is correct. Question six, forget, forget this. It's confused people. Question six, the answer is true. A and B made a contract. Between A and B, that's enforceable. Whether you call an easement, you call a license, I don't really care. It's a contract. And it's a binding contract between A and B. But in property, we don't only really care about A and B. We care about what happens in the future. What happens if A moves away and then B moves away and the successors come along? Can this easement or can this contract be enforced? The answer is no. Why? There's no privity of estate. In order for it to be privity of estate, you need to create the easement properly. Right? For, the, for there to be privity of estate, you need to create the easement properly. And how do you create an easement properly? I'm sorry? Well, sure it does. Statue of frauds. But more importantly, the easement must be created as part of the sale of the property. Right? A owns Black Acre and White Acre. A hands off. I'm sorry. A sells Black Acre, reserving an easement for himself or someone else. Right? The only way to create an easement as properly, a proper easement, is as part of the sale of property. That's how you get privity of estate. If you have privity of estate and you create a valid easement, it's then binding on successors. Doesn't matter who lives in A. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter who lives in White Acre. Doesn't matter who lives on Black Acre. Each successive owner can benefit or burden from that easement. So there's an incentive to create your easement properly. Don't just do what they did in question six. You just sell them an easement right away. That's temporary. It only lasts for one owner. If you want your easement to last, you must establish privity of estate to bind successors. Everyone got that. So six is true, seven is false. I just want to see the results. I don't want to confuse people before. But most of you got this one right. Less got this one right, but it's still a majority. Okay. I'm okay with that. Yes, sir, Ivan, then. So with this one, uh, if there was previous <coughs> mistake, it still wouldn't be able to transfer some successors, right? Uh, this is an easement in gross, correct? So therefore, um, uh, it would only be inherited. It cannot be conveyed. Yes, Alexa? In order to have pre pre with an easement, in order to have privity of estate, the easement must be created when the land is transferred. Right? The easement must be created when the land is transferred. Go back and reread the Church of Christ case with the parking lot case that Minor mentioned a few moments ago, right? That's how you establish privity of estate.
Okay. Everyone get these examples. Now, I've never used this language before, privy of estate, privy of contract. I will starting today. If you look at the readings about covenants, these terms matter a lot. For easements are not quite as important, but for covenants, they matter. Why? Easements are a lot simpler to work with. They're just less rules. But covenants have a lot more rules and unfortunately, a diagram that will haunt your dreams uh, will give you nightmares. I'm sorry, it's true. All right. We're 30 minutes in, still in easements. Any questions before we go to covenants? All right, so I encourage you um, in the, um, you know, the folder of the case summaries, I have a document for today called Servitudes. Read this one cover to cover several times. I think it's pretty good. Maybe I'm biased. I am. But read this several times. In fact, my lecture today will be based largely on this document where I'll walk you through easements, covenants, and equitable services. Um, <clears throat> again, if you don't get today's class, spend some time with that. Um, uh, spend some time with that, 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 that guide. All right. Everyone with me? All right. So again, the theme of our topic, the theme we're working on today is called servitudes, right? Servitudes are agreements that benefit and burden lands. And there are two primary types of servitudes, two primary types, easements and covenants, right? We've already done easements. We'll do covenants today. Okay. So again, we have easements and covenants. There are two ways that a covenant can be enforced. Okay, the first way covenant can be enforced is at law, a real covenant at law. The second way a covenant can be enforced is in equity, what's called an equitable servitude. An equitable servitude. Now, I'm sure you've learned this at various points, but historically we had two systems of courts. You had the courts of law and the courts of chancery, the courts of equity. You learned this before? Does this sound somewhat familiar? Right? Okay, good. Um, the courts of law had a very particular remedy they could issue, which was damages. The court of equity, the court of chancery, could issue a different remedy, the injunction. Today, all the courts are merged. So a single court could issue either judgment and damages or judgment and injunction. But back in the day, you would need to go to different courts for different remedies. Real covenants at law were enforced in the courts of law. And a violation of a real covenant resulted in an award of damages. An equitable servitude, by contrast, was enforced in the court of chancery. And for a violation of an equitable servitude, the remedy was an injunction. Again, today, the courts have merged in, in every state, but I think Delaware, right? But you still need to know the distinctions. Everyone with me? We've discussed in the past dominant estate and servient estate right the dominant estate is one getting the benefit the servient estate is the one providing the benefit that same terminology extends to covenants so with covenants there will be a dominant estate and a servient estate okay now someone's gonna ask josh is there a covenant in gross no there's no such thing Right? With covenants, the benefit always attaches to land. There's not going to be a covenant in gross. That's not a thing. Please don't make it up. It's not a thing. I'm telling you. There's no covenant appurtenant. That's not a thing. That doesn't exist. So you have easements in gross, easements appurtenant, fine. But there's no covenant in gross. There's no covenant appurtenant. Please, on the exam, when I say that, my heart just breaks. Right? There's no covenant in gross. Because it means a student knew their stuff and just confused at the last minute. To even know what appurtenant means is impressive, but they just put it in the wrong spot. All right. All right. So again, we have two types of covenants. You have the real covenants at law or the equitable servitude. As a shorthand, I'll just say covenant. If I say covenant, I really mean a real covenant law. I'll say equitable servitude, but I'll otherwise like I'll say covenant. So when I say covenant, just think of real covenant law, even though I don't say the full phrase. They just call them covenants. Everyone with me? Okay. 
All right, so how do you create a real covenant law? Okay, uh, there are three requirements which are not very helpful. <laughs> I'll tell you in advance. These three parts will not make any sense to you, but I'll give it to you anyway. The first one is straightforward enough. The parties must intend to bind their successors. Right? The first requirement to create a real covenant law is the parties must intend to bind their successors. What does that mean? Okay, think back to question six above, right? Question six. In question six, it's here, this was just a contract between A and B that would only last so long as A and B are around. This fact pattern doesn't suggest they want to bind their successors. If they did, they would have done something else. It would create an actual easement, right? So you must look at the facts and say, is there an intent to bind their successors, right? Are they just creating a license that's temporary between the two of them? Or are they trying to do something that will attach permanently to the land? Uh, this is always, is it objective, Josh? Is it subjective? Uh, both, as is always the case. Um, but the parties will usually say, we create this covenant for ourselves, our assigns, and forever, right? That sort of language suggests they want to bind forever. You see that sort of language for their heirs, for their assigns, forever? That's a pretty good clue that this is meant to bind successors. All right. First one's actually not that hard. To, that's the easiest of the three prongs. The second one is very hard to define. I'll tell you what it is, but I can't give you a definition. That the promise between the owner of the servient estate and the owner of the dominant estate must touch and concern the land. That the promise must touch and concern the land. What on earth does that mean? Well, at common law, the phrase touch and concern means that the promise restricts how the servient estate is used. That the promise restricts how the servient estate is used. What does that mean? For example, uh, A is allowed to cross over Blackacre. Okay, that's a restriction. Uh, uh, Blackacre will not operate a factory, right? Blackacre will be used for residential purposes, right? Uh, Blackacre will be used for agricultural purposes. Some restriction, right? Those are the easy cases. Does this restrict how the land's used? That touches and concerns the land. More modern cases we'll study in class for uh, Thursday are tricky. And for example, what about a requirement to pay uh, dues to a homeowner association? Do those dues touch and concern the land? The modern courts say yes. So in common law, this phrase had some teeth that you had to restrict the land. In the modern cases, touch and concern means basically whatever you want. Anything touches and concerns the land. So you'll see this in the reading for Thursday in the Ponza case. Modern doctrine basically reads the second element out. It's just it's always going to apply. So the first element almost always applies in modern cases. The second element almost always applies. What about the third element? The third element goes back to our concept of privity, right? In order for a covenant at law to be created, there must be privity of a state. Privity of a state to the owner of the serving estate and the owner of the dominant estate. There must be privity of estate between the owner of the servient estate and the owner of the dominant estate. Yes. Yes. You stop midway. It's the same thing as horizontal, not vertical. Kind of. We'll get there. Don't don't give me horizontal vertical yet. Yeah, I'm not ready for that. But you're you're on the right track. All right. So again, privity of a state. The third element is a privity of a state must exist between the owner of the dominant estate and the owner of the serving estate. So going back to question number six and seven. There is no privity privity of a state here. Why? Because the easement was just sold as a one-off, right? It was not sold as part of a land transaction. 
Let's look at question number uh, eight. No, no, I'll do eight. I'll do it a little bit later. Okay. All right. So how do you get? So again, the first element is very easy to satisfy. The second element is basically doesn't even matter anymore. The third element is really where your difficulty comes in. So how do you establish privy of estate between the owner of the dominant estate and the owner of the serving estate? What you need to have is a land transaction, right? You need to have a land transaction of some sort, and these, the, sorry, the covenant must be created as part of that transaction, right? The covenant was created as part of that transaction. So, for example, uh, A owns White Acre and Black Acre. A sells Black Acre to B. And in that same transaction, a promise is made. What's the promise? B promises that Black Acre will be limited to residential purposes. Again, A owns White Acre and Black Acre. A sells Black Acre to B. And in that same transaction, B promises that Black Acre will be limited to residential purposes. Here, there's privy of estate. Why? There's an agreement between the owner of the dominant estate, which is White Acre, and the owner of the serving estate, Black Acre. Okay? And the promise was made as part of a transaction. Everyone see why there's privy of estate there? There's nothing on the board here. This is the, yeah, with the one later. Everyone see why this privy of estate in the example I just gave. Max? So is it fair to say like for privity, you, there kind of is like sub elements where it's like writing or like statute of frauds? Because if you have a land transaction, doesn't it have to be like on, in writing? Yeah, it should be in writing, sure. So, but you can, you can also have a, you also have a writing thing. I'm conveying you a covenant just on a piece of paper, right? The statute of frauds is not enough. You need to satisfy that the promise is made as part of the land transaction. That's how you get privity of estate. Is it illegal to have land? Is it illegal to have land? Of course. Yeah, covenant means promise. Think of the Ark of the Covenant, right? The, the, the word covenant means promise. You have to have some agreement to create a covenant. All right, so let's see the three factors. Clayton, let me call on you, right? So, so the example I just gave, again, a owns White Acre and Black Acre, right? A sells Black Acre to B, and in that same transaction, B promises Black Acre will be limited to residential purposes. Okay, so let's go through three, out, three factors, right? Number one, is there an intent to bind successors? Yeah, yeah, they're creating this for the long haul. Does this restriction touch and concern the land? Yes, it does. It restricts how Black Acre can be used. Is there privity of estate here? There is. Check off all three boxes. In the example I just gave you, because all three boxes are created, a real covenant law was established. Right? Now Black Acre is restricted. It cannot be used for industrial purposes, for example, only residential. Now, Julianne, what happens if if B builds a factory? What can A do? Correct. And B builds a factory. For what remedy? What kind, what, kind of, what kind of covenant was created here? So what remedy can be sought? Correct. A real covenant law was created. Therefore, A can seek damages in court against B. Make sure you get your remedy straight. This is another thing uh, people will slip up on the exam. No injunction here, damages. Now, often the threat of damages is so great, they'll just stop, they'll shut down the factory, right? But the threat of damages is real. We discussed before the value of an injunction versus damages when we did the nuisance topic. So that relates back. By the way, I can, I can lump together a nuisance question with a covenant question real easy so they overlap with a remedy being sought. Just, the exam should not be surprised. I'm telling you in advance all the things I can ask you about. Yeah, Ben? How do you perform the damages on the covenant? 
Um, I mean, that's a good question for anyone, anyone else class, right? How do courts determine damages? No one ever sit on a jury? So I've, I've never been to a jury. I, I went to jury a couple times. I was always excused. Uh, law professor, they don't want me on the jury. No, no, I'm serious. Like, so I was called a couple years ago. It was a criminal case. It was actually one where there was an off-duty cop uh, beat someone up, uh, a, a private security job. And um, I swear, the lawyer said the, they were doing the what's called Wadir or Texas Board Dyer, right? Wadir. And the lawyer asked, Professor Black, can you please explain the Fifth Amendment to everyone? I'm like, oh, God. And the reason why is the jury is supposed to find the facts, not the law. And of course, I know the law well enough, maybe better than the lawyers, right? I had some of those my students, perhaps. And I don't want to be influencing the jury. So they excuse me real quick. Get out of here. Go. Um, but to your question, how do you calculate damage? It's a really hard issue. The only experience I have with that is once you're the law clerk, we had a bench trial, right, with no jury. And when you have a bench trial, who calculates the damages? The court. So, I mean, this is just awful, but I was sitting there going to the judge, like, judge, how do I make up damages? Because there was pain and suffering. I mean, there were a lot of really hard issues. I'm like, how? it's like, Josh, come up with a number. I'm like, oh, God. So it's hard. At least you have 12 people. You can kind of just bounce things off each other. But, but it's a very difficult process. Now, when you're talking about damages for violation of a covenant, uh, perhaps you can calculate, you know, let's say that there was smoke, there was emissions, they polluted the water. You know, you can figure out what the actual cost is. But calculating damages is not easy. Forget calculating punitive damages. Oh, man, how do you even do that? How do you decide a number meant to punish and deter conduct? I mean, what? I mean, there's there's actually uh, cases suggesting that the due process clause constrains how big punitive awards can be. This is the uh, the BMW versus Gore. Probably say that in towards a Cipro or something. Good question. What else? Yes, uh, Jade. No, no, no. Only this dominant estate can enforce it. We'll talk when we get to the diagram. I promise. We'll talk who can enforce the covenant. But just the example I gave you before, A and B, that's it, just two parties, have a real covenant law, B builds a factory in Blackacre, A goes to court, seeks damages, and can prevail. Okay. Yes, Duke? But if you sue for nuisance, and it was a had covenant, you could use that. Correct. I mean, you can sue for nuisance and for violation of the covenant. You can do double dipping. And again, I told you, I warned you, I can I can pair those issues on the exam very nicely. They overlap. Because very often the violation of a covenant very well be a nuisance as well. There's gonna be not always, but there's gonna be overlap. All right, everyone with me? Okay. So let's move on. So so far again, we just said A and B. But with property, we don't just care about A and B. We care about other people. All right, so your book has this diagram, page 841. Um, I made a variant, which I'll get to in a minute. But if you notice, I want to show you what the diagram looked like in the prior edition. That's why I jumped on Daisy's question. Because she was right, but I just want to make this point very clear. You're right, you're right, you're, you're correct. Okay, this is what the diagram looked like in the prior edition. What's wrong with this diagram? This is rather the ninth edition of Book Three for almost 40 years. Right? What's wrong with this edition? On the left and the right side, there were two things called vertical privity, which had completely different meanings. The diagram used the same terms to describe different concepts. You can't do that. So what I used to tell my students was in your book, take a pen and just cross out vertical privity on this side. So you'll confuse yourselves. Now, again, this was the diagram last time. Everyone flip to page 841 in your books. And take a look at what it looks like now. They change it. I have no flipping it. Well, digital books, you know books. I, whatever, fine. I, I knew you would have it. Fine. 841. They completely changed the diagram. So now they say, on this side, no as vertical privity, blah, 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 blah. No as vertical privity, blah, 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 blah. Meaning there's different meanings. So because I complained, they corrected the diagram. No, it's true. If you have the preface, they actually thank me. I'm in, I'm in there, right? But this is a topic that bothers me every year, and they finally fix it after a decade of whatever. Okay, good. So this diagram, yes, Maxim? As, as a general rule, so like only the dominant estate can sue for damages? I'm not there yet. We're not ready for a general rule yet. I got, this is going to take another 45 minutes. Okay. Let's get the clock, yeah. Uh, we, we got time left, don't worry. So again, 
the diagram in the book is fine. I like mine a little bit better. But you're welcome to use what's in the book. It's, it's the same information. Okay. So there's some terminology that we have to walk through. And this is going to just take some time. I'm sorry. Okay. We have two parties initially. We call them Amy and Bob. Just to make it easy. A and B. Okay. It depicts that Amy has white acre and Bob has black acre. Okay. And between them, there's privity of estate. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, Julianne, in order for there to be privity of estate between A and B, what had to happen beforehand? Conveyance. That's right. So the first thing I don't like about this diagram is it, it ignores the the um, the original transaction, right? In order for there to be horizontal privity between A and B, there must have been some prior transaction, right? There must have been some prior transaction. What was that transaction? Amy owned both White Acre and Black Acre. And Amy conveyed Black Acre to Bob with a condition. That there be a covenant placed on Black Acre. Again, Amy owned both White Acre and Black Acre. Amy conveyed Black Acre to Bob, but reserved a covenant, reserved a promise. So, what does that mean? We have a promise given. Who gave the promise? Bob. He is the promise. Soar. O R gives. Remember that trick? O R E E. And who received the promise? Amy. Amy received the promise. Bob is the promisor. Amy is the promisee. Which property is being burdened? Blackacre. Only residential purposes. Which property is being benefited? Quiet Acre has the benefit of quiet, no industrial uses in their neighborhood. Okay. So again, Amy owned White Acre and Black Acre. Amy conveyed Black Acre to Bob, but in that same transaction, Bob made a promise to restrict usage to residential purposes. We say that there's privity of estate between A and B. Why? Because the promise was made as part of the land transaction. This privative estate. Everyone with me? So we ask, was a real covenant law created? What are our three factors? Is there an intent to bind successors? Absolutely. You don't jump through these hoops unless you do. Does this restriction touch and concern the land? Yes, it does. No residen no, uh, only residential purposes. Is there privative estate? Yes, there is privy of estate between A and B. Julian? Uh, elements. You don't like you don't like factors like elements better? Did you have Professor Rempel? He wrote an entire article on that it was called factors. I should know better. Yes, he's very he's right. So I'll say elements. He wrote an article, it's called factors. You're welcome. Hi, Scott. Right. Uh, I, I knew that question you were asked. I was like, yeah, it's Scott, didn't he? Yeah. For those of you who didn't have him, uh, Professor Rampel wrote an article on the difference between elements and factors, and he's right. Okay. So the three elements, if you will. Prongs. No, not prongs. My, the judge I clicked for hated prongs. We weren't allowed to use that word. So he hated, I don't know why, he hated prongs. Okay. You know, like shrimp prawns. I was thinking like shrimp, I say prongs. Um, all right, so everyone with me so far. Okay. So now more terminology. When there is privity of estate between A and B, between the promisor and promisee, we say there is horizontal privity. Horizontal privity. Why is it called horizontal privity? 
because millions of lawsuits have read the stupid diagram. That's the reason. There, there's absolutely nothing. I should call them stupid, right? Um, but there's absolutely nothing in the law that discusses why this is called horizontal privity. It's simply a factor that lots of professors over the years drew this thing on the board in dusty chalk, no PowerPoint back in the day, and A and B were next to each other. They were horizontal. That's it. That, that's the reason. I have, no, I have nothing better to give you than that. that that's why it's called horizontal and vertical privity. Uh, yes, Manor? Yes. And actually, I'll say it backwards. If there's privity of a state, then there's horizontal privity. Again, horizontal privity is not a real thing. It's not actually a legal concept. You read a, a judicial decision, they won't talk about horizontal privity. What matters is the, is the privity of a state. That's actually what matters. Actually, the opinion might talk about it, but it's not, it's not a real legal concept. The law says for a real covenant to be created, you must have privity of a state. That's the third element. Not the third fact, the third element. Everyone with me. I've been. Yes, it does. Why? What's that doctrine called, Ben? What? Merger doctrine. Yeah, I think that's yeah. Correct. Um, to terminate a covenant, if the same person owns both the dominant and the servient estate, the covenant dissolves. In fact, that's one of the few ways to actually terminate a covenant by merger. Because a covenant can live on for forever, hundreds of years. But that's one way to get rid of it. But let's just don't go there yet. I want to just stick with this diagram for a few minutes. Okay, so everyone get why the covenant's created that binds black. All right. Yes, Jade. You can say that I wouldn't, but you can say that. I, I would say there's privity of estate between the promise or the promise seat. That's why I've labeled it. Your creator is a very you know, I know what you're I know what you're getting at, but that's not a legal concept. What matters is that Bob gave a promise to Amy, right? That's actually what triggers the covenant, the promise, the the, the, the promise that was given. M merely saying you created a covenant presumes a valid covenant was created, right? Which is not always the case. You need to go through each of the three factors one at a time. No, I did it wrong. Three elements. I, oh, we've seen the fifth element. That was a good movie. I like the fifth element. It's actually held up pretty good over the years, too. But the the, the three elements of the, the test. Does that make sense, Jade? It's also the Jade Scorpion. You ever seen that movie, Chris, the Jade Scorpion? It was a Woody Allen movie. Not the best. That's our hand. All right. So, so far, all we've talked about is A and B, right? There's a promise between A and B. Now, I'll just ask us a, just a hypothetical question. Kendall. If all we care about is A and B, do they have to create a real covenant? If, if all we're talking about is A restricting the, the use of B, a black acre, do they really need to create a real covenant? What else could they do? I'm sorry? They do an easement, but what else? Short of creating a real covenant that binds their successors, what if they only, what if they only, only want to bind themselves? What could they create? Exactly a contract. Let's say A and B just made a contract saying, okay, B, you promise you won't build a, a factory. Okay. Can you do that? And then there'd be privy of contract. Right? You can do that. But Kendall, this privy of contract, does that run to successors? Correct. The downside of a mere contract is future tenants will not be bound by the, cover, by, by the contract. A contract only binds the people who sign it. You learn this in contracts on the first day, right? Only those who sign a contract are bound by it. But a covenant is a special type of agreement in that it binds successors. So we want to talk about two different concepts. And we have two different sides of the diagram. We have the left side, which is called the benefit side, and the right side, which is called the burden side. Okay, We have the left side, which is the benefit side, and the right side, which is the burden side. What that means is future people purchase these properties. So to keep things very simple, Bob sells Blackacre to Carl, and Amy sells Whiteacre to Diane. Yeah. 
All right. So let's do the burden side first. The reason why we focus so much effort here is we want the burden to run. That is, Bob is burdened, and we want Carl to be burdened. That is, whoever owns Blackacre, we want to be burdened. How do we burden Blackacre? That's a alliteration. How do we burden Blackacre? Okay, we need to have a few things. Okay. So first off, you must create a real covenant law. How do you create a real covenant law? Three elements. Intent, to bind, touch and concern, and horizontal privity. That's privity of a state. Secondly, after you've created the real covenant law, you want the burden to run down between Bob and Carl. The burden to run down between Bob and Carl. In order for the burden to run between the promisor and the assignee, right? Bob is the promisor, Carl's the assignee. You must have privity. You must have privity. Specifically, you must have what's called vertical privity. What does that mean in this context? Vertical privity means that whatever estate Bob has, Carl must acquire the entire estate. Again, whatever estate Carl has, I'm sorry, whatever estate Bob has, Carl must acquire the entire estate. Bob must convey his entire estate to Carl. If Bob owns Blackacre and Fee Simple, Carl will only be burdened if Carl acquires Blackacre and Fee Simple. If Bob owns Blackacre and Life Estate, Carl will only be burdened if Carl acquires Blackacre and Life Estate. You need to have the entire estate transferred. That's what creates vertical privity. Okay? So let me summarize this. In order for the burden to run, you need to have both horizontal privity and vertical privity. Again, in order for the burden of the covenant to run, you must have both horizontal privity and vertical privity. If you only have horizontal privity and you don't have vertical privity, the burden has not run. So let's say that Bob owns in fee simple and he gives a life estate to Carl. There is no vertical privity. Therefore, the burden does not run to Carl. The burden remains with Bob. Right? Bob needs to convey his entire estate to Carl. Let's say that the initial transaction, there's no horizontal privity at all. There's no privity of estate. There's just a contract. The burden does not run. So again, to summarize, the burden to run, you need to have both horizontal privity between Bob and Amy and vertical privity between Bob and Carl. Both of those satisfi must be satisfied. Be very careful. The phrase privity means different things in different contexts. We have privity of contract. We have privity of estate. And then we have vertical privity. Right? These phrases have different meanings in different contexts, and it's very easy to confuse them. Each privity question involves multiple steps. Horizontal privity has the three elements, right? Intent to bind, touch and concern, right? You need to have all the elements factored in. I just made Scott roll over. All the elements factored in? No? Liv, you were waiting. I'm sorry to put you on hold, but I had to I had to run through that. I'm sorry? You always need the statute of frauds. That that's a that, that's automatic, right? The, the statute of frauds always operates in the background, so you always need a writing. That's correct. No, you do not. No, for, for real covenant law, you always need a writing. We'll do the equal servo twos on class on, on I think that Thursday. All right, again, there are 
I know you're going to flow chart this. Susan was asking, Josh, can I flow chart this? You can try. Uh, it'll get messy real quick. It's like with future interest. Your flow chart starts looking really pretty at the beginning and then becomes just a, 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 a jumble, right? But let's walk through this one step at a time. You first ask, is there a real covenant law? The three elements. Do the parties intend to bind their successors? Does the promise touch and concern the land? And is there privity of estate? That is, was the promise made as part of a land transaction? If the answer to those three questions is yes, 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 you've got a real covenant law. Okay, good. That's good enough to buy an A and B. What happens if you want to send the burden down the line to a successive buyer from B to C? In order to bind the successors, you need to also have vertical privity. Vertical privity means that whatever estate the promisor has, the assignee has. By the way, Jay, this is why I don't want you saying creator. I want you to say promisor and assignee. Each of these people have a name, right? Bob is both the promisor and the assignor. He's both. Bob is the assignor. Carl's the assignee. There must be privity of estate, vertical privity between the promisor and the assignee. They must accede. They must move into the entire estate. You know, if there's a fee simple and only a term of years is given, that's not enough to transfer the burden. The burden will stay with Bob. The burden will stay with Bob. But Amy could not sue Carl. If there's no vertical privity, Amy over here cannot sue Carl. You can't do that one, right? When can Amy sue Carl? Only if there's both horizontal and vertical privity. Cool. Here's what happens. Let's say there's no vertical privity. What's Amy going to do? Sue Bob. Amy sues Bob. What does Bob do? He sues Carl. He's in privity with Carl. Right? That's how this stuff works. The reason why we ask, does the burden run, is for the, is for the diagonal, if you will. I call it diagonal. Can you go diagonal from A to C? You only go from A to C. You only, Amy can only sue Carl if there's horizontal and vertical privity. If there's not vertical privity, Amy's got to sue someone. So Amy will sue Bob. And then Bob can in turn go after Carl for damages. In pleading, if you will, if you want to use a civil procedure term. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned so for us. So, sort of think so. It looked like just a window. It, it's actually it's in the same ballpark, right? It's actually a similar idea. I mean, the modern rules of procedure were like influenced by this this sort of covenant law. That stuff came first. Yeah, property is the oldest old school. This is what everything began with property. How are we establishing vertical privity? I'm sorry. How are we establishing vertical privity? Three Only one. Does Carl assume all of Bob's estate? And think of it this way, right? Does Carl step into Bob's shoes, right? Whatever interest Bob has, all of that must be conveyed to Carl. That way Bob's out of the picture. If Bob has a reversionary interest, who said that Cole, right? If Bob has some reversionary interest of some sort, Bob's still in charge. In order for Bob to get out of this covenant, he must give away everything he has. If Bob has any reversionary interest, anything. Remainder, whatever it happens to be, then Bob's still in charge. In other words, Amy has to be able to sue someone, right? Amy's got to sue someone. Whether it's Bob or Carl, she probably doesn't really care, but she's got to be able to sue someone. Carl only gets out of the covenant by giving away his entire interest in Blackacre. If he has any interest remaining, he's still in charge. I know. Your, your brain's hurt, right? <laughs> this topic, I mean, I, actually, I like teaching this topic because I think the rules are very clean, but it's a very hard topic to get. This is easier than future interest. This is actually the worst part. If you get this part, you'll be okay. If you don't get this part, you're in trouble. All right, so, yes, Ivan. We covered um, uh, privity of estate and, and contracts and uh, leaseholds last semester. Is it kind of the same realm? 
Remind me what you're learning. I'll make sure I'm not uh, overlapping. Like sub leasing or signing a, a lease. Who has previous contract with the Swiss Prison <laughs> State as the original? Yeah, I know the case you're talking about. Um, I think the law works a little bit different with leases, so I would not say they're the same. Just the terminology might be the same, but I think it has a slightly different meaning in leaseholds. Yeah, unfortunately, the word privity means a lot of things in this class. Also, we did privity with adverse possession, right? With tacking. Are the parties in privity? So, unfortunately, you have a lot of phrases that mean different things in different contexts. Right? So, you have to keep your terminology straight. So, let me, let me just go back over this one more time. In order for the burden to run, you must show two things that there's horizontal privity and there's vertical privity. How do you show this horizontal privity? You must show that the three factors are created to establish real covenant. Was there intent to bind, touch and concern, and privity of estate? Right? The first two are almost always satisfied. It's really privity of estates where the, where the money is. And how do you create privity of estate or horizontal privity? You show that the promise was made as part of a transaction. That gets you horizontal privity. How do you get vertical privity? That the promisor must convey his entire interest to the assignee. If that happens, there is privity of estate, horizontal, and there's also privity vertical. Yes, Alexa. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. a little bit louder, please. It's a breach. Yeah, it's a breach. You know, for example, they build a factory on the co on, on the property. It's a breach of, of the covenant. We say violate the covenant, breach doesn't really matter. Maxim. So, for an example of the covenant, be like, um, like historical non crazy you have permission to like. Yeah, that could be a covenant. Yeah, the covenant might say you can't make changes to the exterior of your property without permission of a board. Can you do that? Everyone with me? All right. That's how the burden runs. So now, for, for, forget about Carl. Let's just go to Diane for a minute, right? Forget Carl, Carl's not in the picture. How does the benefit run from Amy to Dan? This is a lot easier, okay? The benefit runs from Amy to Dan no matter what. It doesn't matter whether Amy conveys her entire estate to Diane. If Amy assigns any interest in White Acre, then Dan can benefit from the easement. Again, if Amy assigns any interest in White Acre, then Dan can benefit from the, from the, from the covenant. There's no requirement to convey the entire agreement. There just must be some privity. If you could have um yes don't, don't call it vertical privity now this this is what i was complaining about before it may not have made perfect sense right in the prior edition of the book i just want to just show you this again they labeled both axes vertical privity which would seem to suggest that Amy and Diane must commit the entire estate, right? Because if over here, vertical privity means everything. It means same thing here. It doesn't. This is how they revise in the book edition that you have. On this side, it says, privity between promisor and assignee, known as vertical privity, meaning succeeds the same estate. See what they did here. Same estate meaning everything, the entire bundle of sticks. But on this side, they change it. Vertical privity, meaning, succeeds to any interest from the original promisee. You see the difference, right? On that side, it's the entire estate. And here, it's any interest. Now, I find it very confusing to use the same word, vertical privity, to mean two things in the same diagram. Do you all agree? Maybe not. I don't. And this is why I would tell my students in the years past, just cross it out in their book. And you can do the same if you want. I would ask you, please, do not use the phrase vertical privity for the benefit side. You can do it. You're not wrong, right? You, you're, you'll follow what the book says. But from my own experience, don't use the phrase vertical privity for the benefit side because it's always satisfied, right? 
no matter what Amy gives to Diane, there's going to be vertical privity. So I don't even call it anything. It's just, it's just, it's automatic, right? Anytime A gives D whatever interest, the benefit flows to D. Yes. Which side we're talking about? The same or less. Yep. Whatever whatever interest is conveyed. So let's say Amy has a fee simple and she gives a life estate to Diane. Diane's got the benefit. Yes, Alexis. So if I'm gonna get there in a few minutes. I'm bad. D suing C. I'll get there in a few minutes. I promise. I'm not there yet. That's my last. That's like my crescendo of the class. That's like building up to that. Alexa. Um, The same estate and same interest? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's whatever B has, C gets. It's whatever estate they have. All right. But again, if A has a fee simple and D gets a life estate, D benefits. So again, pretend C is not here, right? Pretend we only only doing with D and B. What am I there? I like it better. If there's horizontal privity and D purchases, let's say, life estate onto, onto White Acre, can D diagonal to Bob? Yes. Again, assuming this horizontal privity, and then Diane gets a life estate on White Acre, diagonal. D can sue Bob. Okay. But let's say that there's no horizontal privity. Let's say there's only privity of contract between A and B. It's only privity of contract here. Can D go after B? No. The only way that D can go after B is if there's horizontal privity and some interest is conveyed to Dan. Right? This is why it gets very complex. You must assess, is there horizontal privity or not? If there's only privity of contract between A and B, that is they have a contract, they don't satisfy the elements, the burden, I'm sorry, the benefit, I'm sorry, I'm sorry again. If there's only privy of contract between these parties, Diane cannot sue Bob. You don't get the diagonal. All right. Again, so we've said, when can Amy sue Carl? Right, when can Amy sue Carl? Amy can sue Carl if there's horizontal privity between A and B and vertical privity between B and C. Amy can sue Carl. When can Amy, I'm sorry, when can Diane sue Bob? When can Diane sue Bob? Diane can sue Bob when there's horizontal privity and some whatever privity between A and, D, A and D, right? Any, any interest. Again, in order for Diane to go after Bob, there must be originally horizontal privity, but then any interest can be conveyed this way. Fernando? So on that same note, is D any or some interest? That could be a, a future interest. Uh, I think it's got to be a present interest. Okay. I mean, um, I'm only hedging because I can imagine if, let's say that... Um, you know, I think you know. I think I would say, imagine that um, A kept a life estate for herself and gave remainder to B, and let's say that um, I'm sorry, Amy gave herself a life estate and gave a remainder to Diane. If there was a waste situation, that is, B was destroying the property, I think you could actually have the future remainder person come in and, and, and enforce it. I think that that's possible. And then they would go after B. Go after B for damages. Okay. Everyone see this again. So what, what should you know so far? Number one, when can A sue B? Number two, when can Amy sue Carl? And number three, when can Dan sue Bob? Again, first, when can Amy sue Bob? Second, when can Amy sue Carl? Third, when can Dan sue Bob? Those are the three things we've done so far. I'll do in a moment, when can Dan sue Carl? This is Alexis's question a minute ago. With you, Ivan. Uh, how does it work out in terms of like a reciprocal sum? I'm not there yet. You're so far ahead of me. I'm not there yet. Those are messy. We'll get there, I promise. Probably next class. I don't really get time for today.
There are a lot of questions on today's things. I only get to a handful of them. We'll do more tomorrow or on Thursday. All right, again, when can Amy sue Bob? When there's horizontal privity or if there's just privy of contract, right? If there's just privy of contract, Amy can sue Bob. If you have a covenant, great, but they don't need it. When can Amy sue Carl? For that to happen, there must be horizontal privity between A and B and vertical privity between B and C. What's horizontal privity? It means privy of estate. What's vertical privity mean? It means you take the entire interest. Whatever interest Bob has, Carl gets that interest. Now, what about for Diane to sue Bob? For Diane to sue Bob, you need horizontal privity between A and B. And Diane must obtain some interest in Whiteacre. That's it. Much easier. It's much easier for the benefits to run than for the burden to run. Makes sense, the law. We want benefits to run easier than burdens. Now, the hardest one, this is what Alexis asked me about a few moments ago. When can Diane sue Carl? This is like the, the sort of buildup, right? In other words, when will both the benefit run and the burden run? When will both the benefit run? And the burden run. So again, Amy assigned Whiteacre to D. Bob assigned Blackacre to Carl. Now let's say Carl builds a factory. Poor Carl, right? Carl builds a factory, and Dan's like, wait a minute, you're breaking the covenant. What am I going to do about it? So Diane sues Carl for violating the covenant. Can she do this? Okay. So you need a couple things. First, Amy and Bob must be, have been in horizontal privity. Right? First, you need horizontal privity between A and B. Second, B and C must be in vertical privity. If there's horizontal privity between A and B and vertical privity between B and C, then the burden runs from Bob to Carl. Okay? But we're not done yet. That's only half the equation. We need to ask, does the benefit run from Amy to Dan? Yes. If there's any benefit, any interest con uh, uh, conveyed, the benefit runs from Amy to Dan. If both the burden run and the benefit run, then Diane can sue Carl. That's what we're trying to get to. Right? There are a lot of steps in that analysis. Is there horizontal privity between A and B? Is there vertical privity between B and C? Is there privity between A and D? All those steps must be satisfied. If all the things are true, then Diane can sue Carl for violating the covenant. She can seek damages. Is there some privity, some interest conveyed from A to D between uh, uh, Amy and Diane? Got it? So you just need horizontal with A and B. And they need vertical on both sides. Don't call this one vertical, though. That's what I told you not to do. Any Don't call it vertical. For any interest. Correct. Any interest. If you call it vertical, you'll confuse with the other one. Trust me, it happens every semester. This is why uh, when I, I actually emailed the, the book editor, he's like, wow, I never thought of that. Like, it was the eighth edition of the book, we're like 40 years ago, this book was per published the first time. And like, no one objects. You know, don't, please, don't call this high vertical. It's not wrong, but you'll confuse yourself. Maybe you should. We might confuse yourself by having at it, but I, I try to avoid that. Again, Alex. No, 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 no. Never say that. Horizontal privity only exists at the outset between A and B. We don't, we don't create it later. Um, we would say, though, that, uh, I mean, you can say D and C are in privity. Diane and Carl in privity, but I don't say that. Just I would all if you can just say that Diane can sue Carl for damages, I'll be happy, which is correct. So that's all we're trying to figure out: who can sue whom, right? Because again, if Bob's out of the picture, Bob sold Blackacre off to Carl. Bob doesn't want to be sued. Like, why are you suing for damages? I didn't build a factory, right? I didn't. I didn't, I didn't build a factory. Why are you suing me? This entire game is how to be able to sue Carl, right? Carl's where we're trying to focus our attentions on. What? 
You can call that vertical privity. I'm fine with that. It's just it's, it's on the benefit side. I, I would encourage you not to say vertical privity. Uh, you, look, you, you can. It's not wrong, but but I just I've seen two people make a mistake in the exam. Well, they say, well, the burden doesn't run because Diane only uh, no the benefit doesn't run because Diane only had life estate. Right? It's so easy to do that. I'm sorry. It's it's privity, correct? But don't say vertical privity. You can just say privity. It makes it easier. Ben. So when you say you're running. Or if you're doing the test for running the benefit for like Diane, right? In, in this example, are you just is that just another way of saying you're determining if Diane has the benefit? Correct. Who has the benefit, right? Can Ben can Diane benefit from the covenant? Can she go ahead and sue either Ben or Carl? That's what we're trying to figure out. I mean, this is all about accountability. Who can sue whom in court? That's really what we care about, right? Th that that's why property law exists. Who can sue whom in court? With a contract, only A and B can sue. But once you create a real covenant law, now we're talking because now future people who are not part of the original transaction are still bound by it. Patty, was your hand up? No, no. Okay. Yes, Alexis. So I'm saying you can see and you want to bring up their own. No, it's um, a good question. So your question is, could D sue, let's say Diane, can Diane sue Carl and, and, and Bob? If Bob gave his entire estate to Carl, Bob's out of the picture. So Bob's got nothing left, right? If Bob did not give his entire estate to Carl, no. Let's say that Bob only gave a life estate to Carl, right? Who does Diane sue? And then Bob sues. No, not even. Oh, Carl. Carl, yes. Let's say it again, right? Let's say that, I'll go over here so we can see it. Bob only have a life estate to Carl. Diane cannot sue Carl. But Diane can go diagonal. Diane sues Bob. Bob and pleads Carl. So Carl's going to be involved one with the other, right? But who sues whom? Because let's just say, you know, imagine a situation where Bob is, you know, MIA and just enters default judgment. Then the factory continues. Right. The the reason why Bob's in the picture is he can go after the people he gave an interest to. In other words, if you have a covenant in your property <clears throat> and you convey something less than a fee simple or something less than your full interest, you should know you still be holding the court. Think of almost like a sublease, right? If you give your, your your friend a sublease, right, and he doesn't pay the rent, guess who's gonna be called after for the rent? If you assign it, right, if you assign your entire interest in the lease. You're, you're clean. You're out of the picture. In fact, it's, it's sort of similar to an assignment for sublease. Never thought of it, right? Vertical privy is like an assignment, a complete assignment of your interest. Versus if something less than that, it's only a sublease. It's actually a decent analogy. I'll use that in next class. Yeah, Clayton. So Carl was trying to say Edmund, right? And then, and then oh, wait, wait. Get, this is easy. There are only four people. Wait till there's like eight people on this right. diagram. And and my friend Ivan asked about a mutual restrictive covenant where the arrows goes both ways, where where Bob restricts Amy and Amy restricts Bob. That'll be next class for the class after, right? That's what a mutual restrictive covenant is, where there's there's promises going both ways. We'll we'll get there. I promise the exam will ask that. Where there's the arrows go up and down, left and right. This is this is the easy clean diagram, which is why I want you to get this one straight. Questions. All I want you to get, again, I told you three pages for 90 minutes. I was not exaggerating. That, that's, that's all it took. I've, I used to teach, <laughs> my first time I taught this, I said, oh, three pages. You know, I, I had like three cases on top of this one, and that I wouldn't get any of them, so I said never again. Yeah, first time I taught this was not pretty. Okay. Questions? All right, so let me, let me try to summarize as best as I can. Um, when you have... A promise made between A and B. Is it a real covenant law? We have three elements, not factors, elements. We have did the parties intend to bind the successors? That's almost always true. Uh, does the covenant touch and concern the land? That's almost always the true. But then the real one is is there privity of a state? Is there horizontal privity? If there is, then the promise binds not only Amy and Bob, but also can bind successors. But in order for the promise to bind the successor, 
Bob must convey his full interest to his successor, Carl. That must be uh, fee simple, whatever it happens to be. We call that vertical privity. But on the benefit side, the benefit will run even if something short of the full state is transferred. Any interest Amy gives Diane will let Diane go to court, and she can sue either Bob or Carl. She can sue Carl if there's vertical privity, and if there's not vertical privity, Diane can sue Bob, who then dragged Carl to court. I think they got it. That's it. Questions? No? All right, I'll turn the exit polling on. Please share your thoughts. I'm in my office. If you want to come talk? Maybe you will, probably. Uh, if not, I will see you all on Thursday. Thank you so much.